Hey guys, what's up? Mad Season here, and this is the evolution of World of Warcraft. This is a series where I take a step back and take a look at how the game has evolved all the way back from its release in 2004 and a little before then. To kick off this series, we're going somewhere familiar yet far away. We're going to be visiting a ghost of the past. It's something that people hold incredible passion for even to this day, and that's the game in the original form, otherwise known as Vanilla World of Warcraft. This will probably be the longest of the series just due to it being the base game. There's so much to talk about and I do want to cover the most major stuff so let's start from the beginning. And just a disclaimer before we begin, although I'll be talking a lot about vanilla and comparing it to the current game, this isn't a vanilla versus current video. I'll be putting on my nostalgia glasses a lot since I love vanilla, but the focus is to just explain what the game was like to start off the series, not to beat that old dead horse. So try not to get into too many arguments in the comments. So, the year is 2001, Wikipedia was just created, The Lord of the Rings The Fellowship of the Ring was just released, as well as the original iPod, and the announcement of a new MMO by Blizzard Entertainment was made. Having developed sort of a niche with isometric games such as Diablo, Starcraft, and of course the Warcraft series, this was most definitely new ground for Blizzard. Although those series were very popular and successful in the genre that they were in, the world of Warcraft was something else entirely. It was announced at ECTS 2001, or the European Computer Trade Show. They said it was a fully-fledged MMORPG set in the Warcraft universe. They boasted about a huge world with a brand new 3D engine and three playable races, the Orc, the Human, and the Tauren, the latter of which hadn't been seen in the Warcraft franchise yet since Warcraft 3 wasn't out at the time of the announcement. Their selling point was that it would be more simple than some of the other MMOs at the time, yet more fun, such as not having severe penalties for dying such as XP or level loss which was pretty popular with a lot of MMOs back then. They wanted it to be a fresh, fun experience, and it had to be to compete with some of the other big name MMOs. So, fast forward three years later, more races and features were eventually announced, and what we got finally in 2004 is this. Two factions, the Horde and Alliance with eight playable races total, nine classes, two continents, 41 zones, six capital cities, 60 levels of character progression, around 22 dungeons, two raids, and one amazing experience. To a lot of people, the World of Warcraft was their first massively multiplayer online role-playing game. It was their first time stepping out of linear RPG-based games such as Zelda or Final Fantasy and stepping into the world of MMOs. Not only did you have so much to explore, but it was with other people from across the world. It was, well, pretty overwhelming to say the least. So this is our starting point for this series, it's the foundation for which we'll be adding on to. From here on out, I want to take a look at all of the major features of the game at various stages see what was received well and not so well, and take a look at how it's all changed from then until now. This is the evolution of World of Warcraft. So let's start where everyone starts, and that's with leveling. As I said, the original cap was level 60, which may seem silly these days. With heirlooms and such, you can probably do that in a day, but back then it was crazy. Once you started to get to the higher levels, you would plan your whole day around gaining half of a level. And I think this can be taken as a good thing or a bad thing. Some people like having a long grind because it puts more investment into your character. 
and others just see it as a chore to get through to get to max level so they can start pushing endgame content. I think this is one of the many driving forces behind the whole vanilla versus current game argument that goes on nowadays. So it took a very long time, months if you played casually and you could only invest an hour or two a day. And because of this long grind, you really felt invested with your character, improving step by step with each level and taking on new challenges gradually. This was when you still got a talent point per level and they had three different talent trees for each class. The beginning of specializations, or specs for short. As I mentioned earlier, all of the leveling was done through two continents with 41 zones. And they were all pretty well done, at least by the standards of 2004. The exception would be the Zone Ashara, which was pretty much abandoned due to its poor geography. They were all extremely varied, just about any environment you can imagine, they had it and it was always a nice change of scenery to break the monotony of the leveling process. You were always looking forward to what the new higher level zones looked like and what challenges they held. Each one you uncovered felt like you were stepping into a world within a world. As for the difficulty, it was definitely harder. It was more grindy, but it was also more difficult compared to the current game, and that's because mobs in general were tougher, and you also had elite quests that required groups to complete, and it also depended on what class you picked. Classes with pets such as the Hunter or Warlock were the easiest to level, with the hardest probably being the Warrior, like not being able to aggro more than two enemies without cooldowns difficult. So overall, the point I'm trying to get across here is that the leveling process was a journey all by itself. There was so much investment into your character before you even hit level 60, and because of that, alts weren't nearly as common as they are now. As for the classes you actually leveled, as I mentioned, it launched with 9. So to set the mood here, I'll describe them as how they were pitched and how they performed way back in 2004 when the game launched. Starting off with the spellcasters, first up we have the mage, who's a pure DPS class. You of course have three different talent specializations you could focus on, and that's fire, arcane, and frost. So they were pretty much introduced as the basic spellcaster that most RPGs had, they dealt pretty good damage, and they were highly sought after for their really good crowd control spells such as Sheep, which were much more rare back then. And we also had the Warlock, who was a little more unconventional. This class also used magic, but focused on dark arts and demons. You had the Destruction spec, which powered up your hard-hitting spells like Shadow Bolt, the Affliction spec, which focused on damage over time spells, and the Demonology spec, which made your demons more powerful so they could do the work. They're also a DPS class, but they were also great supporters because they could banish elementals and demons. They also had the Soul Stone, which gave you an extra life, and Health Stones to hand out to your friends. And they were the only class that could summon, so they fit that support role very well. And another caster we had was the Priest. They were the main healers for Vanilla, but you could also deal some damage depending on your spec. Holy Spec was for pure healing, Shadow Spec was their dark alternative focusing on damage, and Discipline was kind of a hybrid. They could heal and still do some damage at least. Actually, they were designed to be a melee spec if you can actually believe that. That's why their old inner fire spell gave them attack power, which was useless for spellcasting. As I said, this class was one of the best, if not the best for healing, and it's what most people wanted out of a priest for endgame. This brings up something that was very different back in the day. Although each of these classes had three specs each, a lot of them were highly imbalanced. The talent tree technically allowed you to put points wherever you want, including an equal amount in each spec. But typically for PvE, there was one, maybe two cookie cutter specs for each class, and if you deviated from that, you usually suffered. For the priest specifically, you could go shadow spec and do damage, but the downside with them is that they would burn through mana quickly and therefore deal low damage. And at that point, you would just be switched out for a pure DPS class that could do more damage than you, such as a rogue. And similarly, if you tried to heal with discipline and raiding, it was the same sort of thing. Casually, you could pick whatever you wanted to, but if you wanted to be serious with endgame, you pretty much had to follow suit with what the best spec was at the time, and it was a big flaw in terms of game design. It did happen, but it was pretty rare to see Feral or Balanced Druids or Retribution Paladins in high-end raiding guilds. And speaking of hybrids, let's get into those. The prime example was, and still is, is probably the Druid. They could tank, heal, or deal damage. Feral spec was both a tanking and a DPS tree, Balance was for spellcasting DPS, and Restoration was the healing tree. Quite literally, ever since the Wrath of the Lich King, actually. This is one of the Jack of All Trades, Master of None classes, and it suited players who wanted to do a little bit of everything. But once again, it suffered from the cookie cutter problem, and most competitive druids ended up being restoration spec, at least for PvE. But in PvP, you did see some specializations designed specifically for flag running in the Warsong Gulch Battleground. 
Just like the Warlock, they had their place and they fit it well. Anyways, our next hybrid is the Paladin, which was actually Alliance only. Protection spec is the tanking spec, Holy is the healing spec, and Retribution was for melee DPS. Once again, a class that's a jack of all trades, and while being able to bring any three roles to the table, the Paladin was highly sought after for their blessings. These have been changed a hundred different ways since then, but they had these little 5 minute buffs for casters and melee that were really helpful. Although annoying to keep up in a 40 man raid since by the time you finish buffing the 40th player, the first player you buffed would need a refresh. So unless you have multiple paladins, if you were the only one, you mainly just followed the group and mashed blessings the whole time, only occasionally throwing out some heals in combat if you had the mana. Their counterpart in the Horde exclusive was of course the Shaman. They're a little less versatile because they can't tank, but they made up for it bigly in other ways. They have the healing spec, restoration, and although not by design, two DPS specs, enhancement and elemental. Elemental is a spellcasting DPS spec, and what a lot of people don't know, funny enough, similar to the Discipline Priest melee spec, enhancement was supposed to be for tanking. That's why their Earthshock used to generate threat and one of their totems taunted. And it makes sense if you compare it to the Alliance only Paladin. One spec for tanking, one for healing, and one for DPS. But it turns out, if you only have one threat generation spell, no real taunt, and male armor, you don't make for a very good tank. So they just ended up being a melee DPS spec that pulls more threat than normal. But something else they had going for them were their totems. This is the answer to the Paladin's blessings. Some of these buffed the entire raid with enhancements, both for casters and melee. I know it seems unthinkable now to have such a different raiding experience just depending on what faction you picked, but it was the case back then. It was something that was born before everything was streamlined for the sake of balance, and it has its good sides and bad sides. Obviously a bad side would be that, for certain fights, one side would have it way easier than the other. But there is a charm in having such a difference between the two factions. I mean, the two factions cohort with one another so much now, even sharing capital cities. The only barrier that remains is that you can't talk to each other, unless you add them as a battle take friend, of course. In vanilla, there was such a stark contrast between the two factions, and it's something that's become muddled over time, I think. Anyways, let's get back on topic. There was also the Rogue class, the first pure melee DPS class on our list. This is the typical thief character that you see in RPGs. They specialize in agility and stealth to subtly assassinate their enemies in combat. And the three specs were just that. Subtlety, assassination, and combat. Subtlety focused on improving your stealth and general sneakiness. Assassination had more of a focus on poisons. And combat was a swashbuckling dual sword or mace style. As for the specialty of the rogue in PvE, it wasn't buffing, versatility, nor supporting. It was pure, raw damage. The rogue was one of the most prolific damage dealers in vanilla, and if you had the damage meters back then, it would be filled with yellow bars. And they were one of the best PvP classes out there due to that damage and their stunlocking abilities. They were the main reason for diminishing returns to be added to the game, in fact. Our next class is a little less subtle, and that's the warrior. The tanking spec is appropriately named protection, and the damage specs are arms and fury. Just like in Legion, arm spec is focused on two-handed weapons, and Fury back then improved your one-handed dual-wielding abilities, although they sometimes use two-handers as well. Really, what is there to be said about this class? It's pretty much in every game ever created. Hack, slash, and crush, and they were pretty good at it. What they were really good at though was tanking, and they were so dominant in that aspect, they would pretty much be the go-to class for tanks. Like I mentioned, Feral Druids and Paladins could tank, but they had holes that the Warrior didn't. The Paladin had trouble with aggro because they didn't have a taunt, and the Druid tanking spec was Feral, which is a hybrid of DPS and tanking. The Warrior had threat generation, a taunt, and a ton of armor from their ability to wear plate and equip a shield. They were the best at mighty getting damage, so much so that it later became a problem. To use your abilities, you need rage, and back then to generate rage as a tank, along with attacking, you needed to get hit. Tanks were getting so geared that they weren't taking enough damage to generate enough rage to use their abilities to hold threat. In any case though, they were the standard for tanking back then. And the last class at release was the Hunter. They of course focused on ranged combat, but mainly through physical damage as opposed to the spellcasting style like the other ranged classes. They used bows, crossbows, guns, and of course their beast companion. Like I mentioned earlier, this was probably the easiest class to level because they could have their pet tank while they focus on the damage. Marksman spec improved the Hunter's ranged damage, Beast Mastery improved their pet's damage in tanking, and Survival Spec was originally a melee focus tree, which was actually pretty terrible. This class is unique in the way that you can tame creatures in the wild as your pet, and with hundreds to choose from too. There used to be ones that were way better than others due to their attack speed, or maybe they had a special ability, but that's all been streamlined now. They had levels separate from your character, and they also used to have a loyalty system to where they became more powerful the more you used them, and you had to feed them to keep them happy, and they used to have a mana bar, so they've changed quite a bit over the years. So, those are all of the vanilla classes. They all had their strengths and weaknesses, and they were all very unique and different from each other. Although alts weren't really a big thing back then, you really did want to play all of them, 
Seeing them in action as fellow RAID members made you feel envious of all of the roles that only they could fit, and you realized how much of an incomplete puzzle you were if you didn't have certain ones. They all provided such differing playstyles that every time you leveled it, it felt like a whole new game. So lots of different choices for what you want to level. Aside from your generic questing, you also had dungeons, usually guarded by elite enemies to show you how fearsome they were. And to actually get inside, you had to clear through them with a group a lot of the times. There wasn't a group finder back then. I won't list all of them because there were a lot, but some of the highlights were the dead mines in Westfall. This one is of course where the rebellious Edwin Van Cleef resides along with many other outlaws. We also have the stockades in Stormwind, where the prisoner Basil Thread started a riot. There was also the Scarlet Monastery which had four separate wings. Here you investigate the crazed cult and take down some of the higher ups. And for the higher level stuff we have Stratholm. This used to be one of the biggest cities in Lordaeron, but it's since turned into a scourge infested wasteland. You have Skolomance where Kel'Thuzad founded his Cult of the Damned before he became a Lich. And the Blackrock Spire located in Blackrock Mountain. This held some of the leaders of the Blackrock Orc Clan including the war chief Rend Blackhand. It was usually split up into two parts due to its extreme length, upper and lower and it was technically a raid since you could bring more than 5 people in. So those are just a few examples, like I said tons of dungeons on your way to 60 to make that journey much more intense. I said 22 earlier, but that depends on how you want to split them up. The Scarlet Monastery was officially counted at 1, but there are 4 instance portals, so that's up for debate I think. So now that we got the groundwork and the journey to endgame covered, let's talk about the endgame. Just like with any MMO, you have 2 routes to go to once you reach max level, and that's PvE or PvP. Let's talk about PvP first and save PvE for later. At release, there actually wasn't any structured PvP going on. Battlegrounds weren't released yet, so the only PvP you had was world PvP. And there was no honor system in place, so the only reason to do it was to just do it. One of the first PvP hubs was the old South Shore vs Terran Mel Battles. And why this place? Well, it's where a lot of Alliance and Horde first saw each other. The Horde, mainly undead, are exiting from the Silver Pine Forest from the north, and the Alliance, mainly Dwarves and Gnomes, are going through the Arathi Highlands from the Wetlands from the south. And what happens when two people of opposing viewpoints or agendas meet each other? Well, violence, of course. A horde would get killed and call in a friend, they'd get revenge, and the Alliance would call in two friends, and it just escalates until you have an all-out bloodbath. On my server, which was even PvE, it seemed like at any time, any day, you went to Hillsbrand, there was a battle going on. And there wasn't any objective or reward other than crushing your enemies, seeing them driven before you, and hearing the lamentation of the women. It was PvP in its purest form, and even if you were level 20, you could join in. You would get destroyed, but hey, you could get a shot in or two before that. And for a lot of people, it was fun because it was their first experience with PvP. No longer were you killing scripted NPCs and gaining XP and loot. You were killing another player on the other side of the keyboard. It was pretty broken and imbalanced in a lot of ways. Some classes were far more powerful than others, rogues were knocking out 70% of a mage's health bar out of stealth, crowd control effects could last for a minute so that's when you would take a bathroom break and all sorts of stuff. But it was still fun since, like I said, it was a lot of people's first experience. Eventually things got a little more structured with patch 1.4 in May of 2005. This added in the honor system which gave you ranks to work towards in PvP. There were 14 ranks for each side and they each had high level rewards for reaching them. And things progressed even more when the hugely anticipated Warsong Gulch and Altric Valley Battlegrounds were added in patch 1.5. These were instanced head-to-head -head PvP battles that you could queue for, and they eventually had rewards. 
Orsan Gulch is of course a 10 vs 10 capture the flag battle, and the Altrek Valley was a massive 40 on 40 mixed PvE and PvP battle. The goal was not only to kill the enemy's leader, but their captains and lieutenants as well, and to summon giant elemental behemoths to aid you. There was actually a callback to this in the Ashran PvP area in Draenor. The battles would last for days, and in some cases weeks, until the servers went down. Most of this has fallen to the waysides as both factions try to avoid PvP now. It's more of a race to the boss rather than a PvP battleground. But two patches later, in 1.7, the third and final vanilla battleground was added, and that's the Arathi Basin. This was the conquest mode battleground, where the goal was to hold capture points and keep as many as he can. So three very different PvP instances, and they satisfied most people. Even the lower levels could join in, although the tiers were separated by nine levels, so if you had a lot of lower levels in your match, it was pretty much a loss. So that's vanilla PvP in a nutshell. It was pretty imbalanced, but nonetheless pretty fun in my opinion. So let's get into the main course here, and that's the PvE. We already talked about dungeons a bit. For a while until guilds started pushing raids and people geared up, these were the end game. Just 5 man dungeons. For the most part, they only dropped blues, but that was the best back then. Epics were as rare as legendaries are now, before people started pushing Molten Core and Anixia that is. Each class had a level 60 blue set, and that was the top level end game gear for a while, even though the itemization was pretty terrible. One of the many examples being the Shadowcraft pieces, which was the rogue set having spirit on them. But amidst all of this, raid guilds were forming and taking on the first big raids, and that was Anixia's Lair and Molten Core. Like I mentioned, the Blackrock Spire was also technically a raid, but it was nowhere near the level of these two. Anixia's Lair of course only held one boss, and that was Anixia, and it was a lot of people's first taste of 40-man group raiding. She was appropriately a giant dragon, and before you could even enter the raid, you had to complete a fairly difficult quest chain. It was different for each faction, but for the Alliance, the highlight was escorting Marshall Windsor out of the Blackrock Depths instance. The world first kill was by the guild Ruined of Proudmoor on January 30th, 2005, a couple months after release. But it was still a pretty tough fight. You gotta keep in mind that most people's hardest fights so far were dungeon bosses which really didn't have phases. They hit hard and had special abilities, but for the most part, the fights were the same for the full duration. So it was no surprise that when most people died was when Anixia reached phase 2 where she took to the sky and burned everyone from above. And from this fight, the famous Anixia wipe animation was born. It's probably one of the most popular World of Warcraft videos to date, along with Leroy Jenkins. So it was a challenge coordinating 40 people to follow the right strategy, and a lot of guilds did it purely through text instead of voice comms because they weren't as standard as they are now. But they eventually applied mortar duts and took her down. The next challenge for most people was the Molten Core. This is what I considered to be the first true raid. It also required attunement to enter, although it was much more simple than the Anixia attunement and inside awaited 10 bosses, all providing extreme challenges, ending with the mighty Ragnaros. Just to give you an idea, Anixia was first killed on the 30th of January, and the first Ragnaros kill was on the 25th of April, a full 4 month spread in between firsts. Of course that makes sense though, since the Molten Core has many more bosses, but it still says something about the overall difficulty of the raid. And astonishingly enough, the whole raid was rushed out and put together in just one week. That's pretty impressive considering how good the raid was. This, along with Anixia's Lair, is where you could reliably get epic items which were huge back then. The old blue sets from dungeons had more evolved purple sets, which for the most part were amazing in stats and looks. And they really acknowledged the established cookie cutter specs that I mentioned earlier. Back then, there wasn't a set for arm spec, another for fury, and another for protection. For example, the warrior sets were designed around tanking and nothing else, which really cemented that imbalance designed and the need for certain specs and certain specs only. Arms Warriors, if they were smart, wouldn't get the Might set because it was for tanking, Feral Druids wouldn't get the Scenarian set because it was stacked with Intellect, and so on. Once again, that would be unthinkable nowadays, but it was the case back then. But it's all about the perspective and the standards at the time, and back then, even with these holes, the game overall was considered to be the best in the MMO genre by many people. The next raid, the Blackwing Lair, continued with this with their Tier 2 sets. This was released on the 12th of July of the same year, 2005. This raid was the revenge of the Black Dragon fight for your killing of Anixia. Her brother Nefarian is the final boss of this raid, but to get to him you have to take out 7 tough bosses first. This raid was one of the first guild killers because it opened up with two extremely challenging fights, and that was Razor Gore the Untamed and Velastras the Corrupt. The former was the most unconventional boss yet and required extreme coordination and skilled hunters who could kite, and the latter was a big gear check with a side of RNG. Guilds spent months on these fights and eventually just broke up due to members quitting from the frustration and lack of progress. Obviously, there was only one difficulty setting back then, so the only way to do it was to just do it. You couldn't bypass the mechanics by just turning down the difficulty like with what you see with LFR mode nowadays. So sadly, that first room was the most that a lot of guilds saw before they broke up.
But eventually, the survivors broke through and the world first was claimed by the US Guild drama of the Shattered Hand server on the 26th of September, over two months after the release. The next trade was Zolgarab. This was a step down in intensity. The cap was 20 man as opposed to the standard 40 man size they had at the time, so it was a little different. This raid was in the Stranglethorn Vale zone, and it focuses on the jungle trolls of the area and the god they worship, Hakkar the Soul Flayer. But don't let the smaller size fool you. This was a full on raid that a lot of effort went into. There were 8 main bosses and 2 optional summoned ones, all providing unique and tough challenges. Loot wise, it wasn't too bad. You had some quests and a reputation associated with it that gave you some rewards. For the most part, it wasn't quite up to the level of the loot in the Blackwing Lair, so a lot of guilds didn't put too much work in it, but it did have some outliers that were pretty good. The most notable memory that people have of this raid is the infamous Corrupted Blood incident. This was a debuff that Hakkar put on the raid that dealt damage and spread to nearby players. Well, people of course found a way to turn this into a mechanism for terror and got it applied to their pets and then desummoned them and then resummoned them into a highly populated area of capital cities. It spread like wildfire and created a virtual pandemic until Blizzard had to apply some patches to fix it. It was so extreme that it's a pretty popular example for epidemic research in the real world, which is kind of funny. And the next big raid was the Temple of Ankiraj, or AQ-40 for short. The Kiraji were a pretty new enemy to the game. They're an insectoid race, and the Ankiraj is their main kingdom. This one was a little different in the sense that for the raid to unlock, it wasn't just patched and open. Both the Alliance and the Horde had to work together and collect resources to open it. Cloth, leather, or pretty much any trade good resource. You turn these into NPCs in your main cities, and once you reach the max for all of them, the gates would open along with the big event in the zone that holds it, Silithus. This was one of the most unique and biggest events in the game's history, and to pay testament to that, they recreate it on the 23rd of January of each year when the gates were originally opened. And although AQ-40 was the main event, it also opened up the 20-man counterpart, the Ruins of Ankiraj, or AQ-20 for short. Similar to Zulgarub, this is a full-on raid, but it's just on the smaller side only allowing 20 people in. It had 6 bosses total, with the final one being Osirin the Unscarred. Once again, it provided decent loot, but it was nowhere near the level of what you could get in AQ-40. This raid housed 9 bosses total, 3 of which were optional, and they were all very, very difficult even compared to the Blackwing Lair fights. In fact, another guild killer was the trio of the last 3 bosses, and that was the Princess Huhuran, the twin emperors Veklor and Veklanash, and the final boss, the old god Cthun. These were extremely difficult encounters back to back to back, and it's where a lot of guilds dissolved due to hitting one brick wall after another. In fact, I remember that someone proved that it was mathematically impossible to beat Cthun due to running out of mana. Someone ran a simulation of the best possible tanking, damage, and healing management with the best of the best gear, and it turned out that it still wasn't enough to beat him. Following this revelation, he was hotfixed several times to actually make it possible to kill him. He was so tough that he was considered to be even harder than any of the fights in the next and final raid of Vanilla, and that's next Ramus. Kel'Thuzad is back, and he has something a little more difficult than Skolomance up his sleeve for you this time. It was the crown jewel of Vanilla raiding, and that's next Ramus 40 man. Along with this raid came another event, and that was the Scourge invasion. It was basically similar to the recent Legion invasion event, except on a smaller scale. In short, Necropoli would pop up around the world, and he had to start clearing out undead to defend the area. As for the actual raid, well, it was insanely tough as you can imagine. It was the largest raid yet, with a whopping 15 bosses separated by 4 different wings. And that was the Spider, the Death Knight, the Plague, and the Abomination wings. And after you cleared all 4 of those, you gained access to the final 2 bosses, the Undead Frost Dragon Saffron, and the Head Honcho himself, Kel'Thuzad. It was so difficult that if your guild was able to clear even half of it, you were considered to be the best of the best. Many guilds failed to do this though for 2 reasons. One is just because of the extreme difficulty, obviously, and the second reason was that the Burning Crusade was right around the corner. Next Ramus was released on the 20th of June, and then less than three months later, the announcement of the first expansion, the Burning Crusade, was announced to be on the 16th of January of the next year, 2007. It was common knowledge that with this expansion came an increase to the level cap, and all of the gear even from Next Ramus is inferior to green questing items from the Burning Crusade. This pretty much killed any motivation other than bragging rights to actually clear it. And it's where a lot of guilds, including mine, just stopped raiding to get ready for BC. So as great and challenging this raid was, a very small portion of the player base actually got to see what it had to offer. So much so that it was re-released in the expansion after the Burning Crusade, the Wrath of the Lich King. So at this point, raiding wise, there wasn't a lot of motivation to keep grinding away at it. People hung it up, took a break, and just mellowed out for a bit in anticipation for our next adventure in the Outlands, which as promised arrived a few months after that. And with it marked the official end of Vanilla WoW. For some, it was the end of their journey, and for others, it was just the beginning.
So we went over the leveling process, the zones, the classes, dungeons, raids, PvE, PvP, and the crazy thing is, I left a lot out. I didn't go into more detail with all of the races, I could have talked about professions, but hey, if I did, this video would be two hours long and I don't want to take up that much of your time. I hope this coverage was thorough enough though, and gave you a decent understanding of what we're going to be building out for the rest of the series. This is Vanilla World of Warcraft. Some people loved it, and some people hated it. As for the argument of Vanilla vs. Current, like I said, that's not what this video is about, but for me, it's no comparison. Like, literally, no comparison. Vanilla vs. the Current game are so different now that, to me, they're their own separate entities. It's like trying to compare an apple to a calculator. They both have their goods and bads, they both have their charm and annoyances, but I love them for what they are individually, and the game as a whole has been a big thing for me. I love this game in all of its states, and that's something that'll never change. But whatever you think, I hope you at least found the video entertaining because that's what I care about if you found it worth your time or not. Let me know what you think of it, whether you liked or disliked it. And if you did like it, stay tuned for the next episode, The Burning Crusade. If you're prepared, that is. Anyways, I'm Mad Season Show, and this is the evolution of World of Warcraft.